Okay, welcome back. So today we're going to start talking about the really foundation of evolution. What is evolution? Where did it all start? So <clears throat> like I've previously said, and you'll hear me say it time and time again, evolution is a change over a long period of time. Now, the textbook definition is a change in genetic composition of populations over, over time. We're talking about a long period of time, and what it is, we see the traits are changing, but the traits are ultimately from the genetic composition. The tra traits are being um, uh, created in an organism. When, when you reproduce, your the offspring is going to um, uh, grow and develop based on the genetics. So evolution is that change in the genetics over a long period of time. And what's really changing is uh, at the genetic level mutations, but what's influencing which genes or, or which traits are going to be passed on and, and move uh, through the generations is the environment. So the environment is influencing which genes are going to make it to the next generation and which genes are going to start being phased out. So evolutionary change is observed in laboratory experiments, natural populations, and in the fossil record. So a lot of people uh, say that there's no real proof of evolution. People are making it up. There's nothing to back it up. As time goes on, there, there has been proof for a long time. And as time goes on, there's more and more proof. So we continue to support this theory of evolution as time goes on. So the, the idea that there's nothing to really back it up, um, just it just is not is not the case. So these underlying genetic changes drive the origin and extension of species and fuel the diver diversification of life. Now, um, the theory of evolution. When we use this word theory, all right. Um, typically in 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 common language, when you say theory, theory is kind of like an assumption or idea or some kind of uh, um, um, guess or explanation. You know, oh, I have a theory that uh, the reason we keep losing all the spoons in the in the the dorm room is because uh, my one roommate always throws them out. Okay, that's that's you're coming up with kind of just a guess. You're 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 assuming something. You know, based on maybe previous habits. Oh, I've seen him throw out the spoon once before. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the truth, that you're losing all the spoons in the dorm room because of that one person. It's just kind of an idea. So when you, you use the word theory in that sense, it's not the same as how we use it in science. So when we use it in science, it means that we can't necessarily call it a law. <coughs> Excuse me. We can't call it a law because um, laws are something that you're able to prove. I'm able to put the... the um, uh, the, the evidence in front of you, um, or I, I'm able to conduct an experiment in front of you and to show you that that is the case every time. So laws, I'm able to uh, recreate and show you in, in your face right then and there. Theories are really something that I can't necessarily show you, but I can show you all the evidence that I have that supports this idea. So theory doesn't mean that it's just a guess. It means that it's something that I have all this evidence that supports it, but I can't quite call it a law because of the nuances with it. So it, in physics, there are a lot of laws because I can um, take something and I can show you how matter is going to be influenced by energy and I can recreate it and I can prove to you, hey, this happens every time. That is a law. But evolution, we're talking about things that happened in the past. And I can try to recreate scenarios in present day or in the lab to show you how um, the, the, uh, the concepts are still relevant. But I can't go back in time and specifically show you that fish became amphibians. I can't do that. So all I really can do is have all this evidence, all the, the fossil evidence, the genetic evidence, the morphological evidence. I can have all these things and I can show you all the evidence where it looks like, hey, you know what? This must be the case. But instead of calling the law because I can't go back in time and show you, I have to call it a theory. So um, the evolutionary theory is the understanding and application of the process of evolutionary changes to biological problems. So their problems are going to arise in, in or for an, an organism. 
in the environment. So the environment is, is going to change. Something's going to happen in the environment. The environment's going to be tough. And now it's up to um, the, the organism or over generations to change to fit that environment. So applications include study and treatment of diseases, development of crops and industrial processes, understanding the diversification of life. All of these things um, are influenced by our understanding of the theory of evolution. So it also allows us to make predictions about the bi biological world and the way that we are influencing the biological world. So a lot of times when you hear about climate change, people are talking about, hey, how is this going to have an influence or going to affect the organisms that are here today? So theory um, in every speech, untested hypothesis or a guess, but we, what we, um, when we use it, it refers to our understanding of a process um, that uh, um, results in genetic changes over a long period of time and um, our, our use of that understanding to interpret changes we observe in natural populations. So even before Darwin, biologists had suggested that species had changed over time, but no one had proposed a convincing mechanism for, for evolution. So you always hear about Darwin. Now, Darwin didn't come up with um, this idea um, completely that, that things must be changing over time, but he was the one that really came up with, with a, a thorough uh, explanation to what are the specifics and the nuances to things changing over time. Why are they changing? When do they change? What's going on with this? So, <clears throat> excuse me, we talk about Charles Darwin. He's really the, the one that that gets all the credit for this theory of evolution because he wrote the book, The Origin of Species. And in his book, The Origin of Species, he talks about descent with modification and natural selection. So these are two terms that you're going to want to know, descent with modification and natural selection. These are terms that not only do we use time and time again, but Darwin constantly used. Believe it or not, Darwin didn't really talk about evolution with the word evolution. He didn't really talk about, um, oh, things are evolving. This is called evolution. He referred to it as descent with modification, which is driven by natural selection. Okay, so we see the, these uh, photos of Darwin as an old man, and obviously, you know, he, he grew old and he, he started to public, publish more things as he became more famous. But Really, when Darwin was in the field, he was a much younger man. And, and Darwin, as much as we like to think of him as this great naturalist or, or scientist, this, this brilliant scientist, at one point, or, or when he was really collecting his data and coming up with his theories, he was a young, uh, kind of a lost young man. So he was very interested in geology and natural history. And just to give you some background, um, he went to his, 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 he came from a well-to-do family and his father wanted him to go to med school. So he went to med school and he flunked out. He, you know, he, he wasn't um, committed enough. He didn't put the, the time in. He wasn't interested in it. So he didn't do well. And when he flunked out uh, of, of med school, you know, obviously he had issues with his father and his, you know, his father wanted him. He came from a well-to-do family. His father wanted him to be something, to, 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 to do well for himself because his father had done well for himself. So when he flunked out, that was a major issue. Darwin was kind of this uh, lackadaisical guy that wanted to just kind of look at rocks. And he liked looking at um, certain um, organisms, you know, beetles and, and, and butterflies, things like that. So he really liked science. He liked geology and, and zoology. He liked those things. But he didn't want to become a doctor, and uh, and and he wasn't very um, committed to necessarily um, the the path of of, of becoming well educated. So, in 1831, uh, he actually set sail uh, on this HMS Beagle. So his father uh, finds out that, hey, you know, you can you can go on this vo voyage. Um, his father wasn't happy that he was going to go, but. But this was Darwin's chance to uh, go out and really learn about the world uh, around him. And he could um, continue to collect specimen, uh, specimens. He was interested in geology. So he was hoping to maybe learn more about Earth's history because um, 
<coughs> some of his mentors were coming out up with this groundbreaking idea that the earth was also changing as well. So as much as he, Darwin was, went on to, to talk about how organisms change at that time in the early 1800s, they were still kind of coming up with this idea that the earth was changing. And now we look back and we know about Pangea and how all the continents were together and they separated and they're still moving to this day. And we have volcanoes and we have earthquakes and all these things are constantly uh, changing as time goes on. In the early 1800s, that wasn't uh, factual yet. So when his mentors were talking about this, this interested him and, and he wanted to go out and, and see if he could find evidence for uh, this, the, the changing of the earth. So he set sail um, and when he went out, so, you know, as he leaves England and he makes his way out, <clears throat> they're traveling around the um, uh, South America and um, as they stop at different places, he gets, when, he, when they stop at different places, he gets off and he tries to spend as much time on land as possible. He hates being on the ship. He's very sick. Um, he's, he's kind of homesick. He, it, it's, 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 you know, he's in these closed quarters and he's just, uh, sitting on the ship all day, excuse me, um, just, uh, reading and, and writing in his journal and he's kind of bored. And he's also seasick. It's not a fun time. So any chance he gets to get off the boat, he goes to um, he, he goes on land. And he tries to collect specimens and he tries to learn about about the land. And what ends up happening is eventually they land on this island or these this group of islands, this archipelago, off the coast of South America, and it is uh, called the Galapagos Islands. And you can see it here. This is kind of a bigger depiction of the Galapagos Islands. And he sees that when he goes to the Galapagos Islands, these spe these creatures or, or these organisms are very different from the organisms that he encounters everywhere else that he goes. Because everywhere else that he goes, these organisms have had a lot of interaction with humans and they are afraid of humans. They've dealt with humans. They know that humans will hunt them. But when he lands at the Galapagos Islands, he realizes that these things are not familiar with humans at all. They are not afraid. And him being a young man and, and this kind of lackadaisical kid that, that's kind of silly, he is messing with these organisms as he goes. So we, we see these pictures of, of this old looking, stoic looking, wise looking Darwin. Well, when he was going out and collecting his data, he was kind of this silly young, young guy. So He'd go out and he'd catch birds, and and he he noticed how if he if he picked up uh, a, a tortoise and he threw it uh, threw it uh, to the other side of the uh, 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 of the area he was in, it would just continue to walk towards him. It didn't really care. You know, he could throw iguanas in the water. You know, there were marine iguanas there. They would come climbing back. So he noticed that this weird phenomenon that it, on these islands, these organisms were not used to humans. And he felt like, hey, you know what, this th this is interesting because you have these islands that are untouched by humans. So from the observations and insights all right, that he made on the HMS uh, Beagle, he developed uh, this, this idea of evolution. So when he went back and he started talking about what he saw, the different species he saw, he, um, you know, came up with this idea that they have these species and it seems like they're related, but they have Kind of changed and diverged from each other. So he came up with this idea that species change over time, once again, a long period of time, and divergent species share a common ancestor. So that's where he talks about this descent with modification. He's saying, hey, you could have one organism, and if that organism starts to live in different habitats, that those, those different ones that live in different habitats are going to interact with their individual habitat differently and that is going to lead to changes because if this one has one pressure or one type of habitat that uh, it's dealing with it is going to evolve and change to fit right we talk about survival of the fittest to fit with that habitat while this one is going to try to fit with this habitat and over a long period of time they are going to descend and they're no longer going to be the same species and that's where we see that that where we talk about a species going to diverge and then become two separate species. And the mechanism that produces this is going to be um, 
through the environment and we refer to it as natural selection. All right. I am not doing the selecting. God isn't doing the selecting. All right. We're saying that nature. Okay. If you want to say God is creating the nature, that's one thing, but we're saying that nature, the environment. So we talk about natural selection. It's the environment that is doing the selecting that is, um, choosing which, which ones are going to survive, which ones are not going to survive. It's all about living long enough to reproduce. So we look at it and we say, hey, on this, on, in this area, this habitat, is this organism fit for its environment? Okay. Is it going to live long enough to be able to reproduce and pass on those genes? So the environment is putting pressure on those genes to see if those genes are going to be fit enough to live long enough to reproduce. And we refer to that as natural selection. Nature is doing the selecting. Nature is picking which genes are fit for that specific environment or that specific habitat, which ones are not. So in 1858, um, we, obviously you could see that's years and years later, almost 30 years later, um, he still hasn't come out with this idea of of uh, the theory of evolution because he doesn't want to ruin his reputation. So he he is building his reputation as being a, a, a great um, naturalist, but he hasn't really come out with this theory because you got to think back then, um, you know, you're really going against the Catholic Church. It could be a major issue. No one would believe you. You can end up ruining your entire uh, career. So he never really came out. He kind of sat on this idea for 25, 30 years. And um, and it wasn't until this younger naturalist uh, sent him a paper. He knew Charles Darwin was, was this brilliant man. And he, he sent him this paper kind of to say, hey, you know what? What do you think about this? And in this paper from this young guy, Alfred Russell Wallace, um, Wallace is basically telling him about natural selection and descent with modification. And, you know, he's saying all these things. And this is when Darwin goes, oh boy, all right, now more people are, are, are thinking it. If I don't come out with it, someone else will get the, the credit. So what he did was he says to Alfred Russell Wallace, hey, you know what? We're going to come out with this together because I've been writing about this for 25 years. I just didn't say anything because I was worried about the backlash that I would get. And I wasn't so sure about my evidence. So for 25 years, he's collecting more and more evidence to back it up. He, he had this idea when he went to the Galapagos, but he said, you know what? I need as much evidence as possible so that I'm not shunned when I come out with this. And then, you know, he kind of freaks out when Alfred Russell Wallace has, is going to publish his idea that he's been sitting on for 25 years. So he says to Alfred Russell Wallace, look, I've been working on this for 25 years. I have a lot more evidence than you do. We can put this together and then we can both kind of be credited with it because we have the same idea, but it'd be great if we work together. So ultimately, you know, they, they do it together. Darwin then publishes his Origin of Species, which is his, his book about um, descent with modification, evolution, natural selection. And, you know, the rest is history. Alfred Russell Wallace, no one really talks about him. Uh, so much. Charles Darwin kind of stole the spotlight on that one. But they're both technically credited with this idea of natural select selection. But Darwin, you know, he, he, he ended up being able to, to save his, his, uh, his, his ideas by, by having, uh, by working with Alfred Russell Wallace. So by 1900, the fact of evolution was established, uh, but the genetic base of, ev ev of evolution was not um, yet understood. So now, you know, we're talking about um, 120 years after this. Now, you know, we're able to uh, put the genetic component together with the evolutionary component, and we see how they go hand in hand. But when in the 1800s, um, there the, this idea of evolution, genetics, they were two completely separate things. So in the 1800s, they were just starting to come up with this idea of genetics, and and they didn't even even call things. Um, they, they weren't even talking about the, this, this term genes yet, but they had this idea that there were some kind of set of instructions, okay, and, um, and, and the instructions must be in these cells, and, and that, that is going to be passed on from one, um, uh, one organism to, to the next, all right, to their offspring, and so while, <clears throat> while, um, 
Charles Darwin was working on his theory of evolution. You had Gregor Mendel who was working on his, uh, his ideas behind genetics, but the two did not come together until much, much later in time. So this idea of modern synthesis uh, that, that, uh, that they eventually referred to, the, the, the joining of genetics and evolution, didn't take place until the 1930s. So the structure of DNA was eventually established by Watson and Crick in 1953. And then in the 70s, uh, te technology was developed uh, for sequ sequencing long stretches of DNA. And then, you know, by the 90s, a, a lot had been advanced. And now we're at this point um, where uh, we're so much further along, we're able to quickly and efficiently and cheaply uh, um, uh, sequence genomes and, and look at genomes and compare genomes. So evolutionary biologists now study gene structure and evolutionary change using these molecular techniques. So once upon a time, evolutionary biologists might have just looked at, at the morphology and, and the structures and the functions of organisms. Now we're able to look at the genes and see if things are related. So in biology, evolution refers to the changes of genetic makeup of populations over time. Now when we talk about a population, uh, we're talking about a group of individuals, all right? And those individuals all belong to the same species. So um, when we talk about their, their species, they're going to be uh, similar enough to interbreed in a particular area at the same time. And we say that individuals do not evolve. Remember, if there's a mutation or a change in one individual, that is not evolution. Populations evolve. So mutations are going to drive the changes in genetics and then the environment acting on those genetics is going to influence what effect those mutations have on the organisms. Mutations can be uh, deleterious, beneficial, have no effect at all, they're either going to um, remove a, a, a segment of the DNA or a nucleotide, they're either going to um, um, put one in, that, um, they're going to move things around, but they could be, it could be something that helps you doesn't help you uh, hurts you or has no no effect at all so mutation both creates and helps maintain variation in population now mutation rates vary but even low rates create some variation in the population because of mutation different forms of genes so um, if a segment of dna codes for we'll say for example uh, a hair color if we change that seg segment, okay, it might code for a different hair color, right? And when we code for a different hair color, we're still using the same location, right, of that gene, right? So we have different locations or a locus or a loci, but we call the different versions alleles. So the different versions of a gene are called alleles. And when we talk about all the different alleles in a population, all the options of the genes, we're talking about the gene pool. So the sum of all the copies of all the alleles at all the loci is a, is, uh, in a population is a gene pool. So allele frequency is the proportion of each allele in a, in a, a uh, gene pool. So the proportion or, or how often, so you might have two alleles for one gene, all right? Say that um, we have some, some uh, uh, skunk species and they have an allele that codes for how many white lines are on them. And you either have one white line or you have two white lines on you. And at that allele, maybe most have two white lines, 95% of the time they have two white lines and 5% of, of the time they have one white line. Those are the frequencies of those two alleles. And then we have genotype frequencies, the proportion of each genotype among individuals in the population. So here you go. You have a gene pool where if we were to take chromosomes, say that these are uh, microscopic organisms that have these chromosomes, okay, and you are going to have two chromosomes that you get, say that um, when you, when you're, you're, if you have parents and you get one and your parents have two as well and you get one from each parent, well, you get this one got an X from one parent, X1 and X1 from the other or, or uh, chromosome one and chromosome one from each parent, 
All right, this one, from one of the parents, they got chromosome two, and from the other parent, it got chromosome three. And, you know, you got a two and a two. This one has a one and a three. Th these are all the options of what genes you can get, what chromosomes you can get, and that we refer to as the gene pool. All right, when we're talking about gene pools, we're talking about the population. So an experiment demonstrates how mutations accumulate in populations, and they actually did an experiment with E. coli where they looked at how, how many mutations occur over many, many generations. Now, when you're going to look at something like this, you don't want to do it with humans because humans take so long to reproduce. You would only get maybe two generations in before you died as a researcher. So you do something like bacteria, E. coli, and you can look at 20,000 generations. And what they saw is that um, after um, about 2,500 generations, you had about uh, five mutations, about at 5,000, you had about 15. So we could say something like, hey, every 5,000 generations, you have 15 mutations. Now, that's not a lot. That's not a lot of, of mutations when you think about it. If you think about how long does it take for a, an organism to have 5,000 generations. Now, in bacteria, it happens relatively quickly. But when we're talking about animals, plants, well, that's going to take a very long time. So that points further to the idea that it took a long time for evolution to occur. And no one is saying that this was a quick process or that your great grandmother was an ape or anything like that. It's minor, minor changes over a long period of time. And these changes accumulate. So the gene pools of nearly all populations contain variation for many traits. Selection that favors different traits can lead to many different lineages that descended from the same ancestor. So as the um, the environment is putting pressure on these traits. It's going to influence which traits are going to stay around, which ones are going to get weeded out. Um, and that's what we're talking about natural selection. Now, we've been able to pr help prove natural selection by artificial selection. Now, artificial selection is when we pick which traits. So we have been artificially selecting um, uh, organisms or, or specific traits in organisms for thousands of years. If you look at dogs, dogs, we've been, we've been selecting traits for them. We've been breeding them for thousands of years. So that is not nature that is selecting which ones are breeding or which, which uh, traits are going to live long enough to reproduce or, or which ones are going to strive in that environment. <clears throat> it's humans. And that's why we don't call it natural selection. We call it artificial selection. So artificial selection on different traits in a single species um, in wild mustard, all right, or dogs, but wild mustard is another example we like to use, produced many different crops. So wild mustard was just a weed, all right? It just looked like this. And over time, um, people started to select for different things. So you had one group of people that wanted to um, kind of make these leaves bigger. You had another that they found that they had a mutation that had these kind of heads to it. And over time, they kept breeding for bigger and bigger heads. Eventually, you got something like broccoli. And then you have uh, ones that wanted to make more of this leafy bulb. And as time goes on, maybe it started as a small leafy bulb and eventually got bigger and bigger. And eventually, you had cabbage. And then you had things like kale, rhubarb. You had... Brussels sprouts, all of these came from this weed, this wild mustard plant, wild mustard weed. And over a long period of time of people selecting which trait, all right? Think about corn. Corn once upon a time was, was this little um, cob that had these hard uh, um, kernels to it. And the, the this small cob with these hard kernels, over time, someone selected, hey, you know what? As I breathe them, I'm going to um, um, only plant the ones with the, the softest kernels. So over time, they kept planting, kept planting, kept planting. And as they kept weeding out the genes for hard kernels, eventually you get corn that has soft kernels. Same thing with size. You keep taking the biggest ones, the ones that have maybe a little mutation for being a little bit bigger. They keep taking those and only planting the ones that are a little bigger. And over time, those small, those, uh, small cobs end up being very large cobs. So many of Darwin's observations of variation selection came from 
domesticated plants and animals, like I said, artificial selection, because obviously he could not do a lot of the, the experiments that we can do now. He also couldn't go back in time and look at things, and he couldn't breed things that took very long. He couldn't, you know, look at humans or anything like that. So he had to really look at things like pigeons that he was able to, to, to breed or plants that he was able to breed. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, um, Darwin bred pigeons, and he recognized the similarities between, between selection by breeders and selection in nature. And in both cases, cases, selection simply increases the frequency of the favored trait. So whether nature favors it, it's going, going to increase the, the uh, frequency of it, or if the breeder favors it, it's going to increase the frequency that we see it from one generation to the next. So here you go, you have pigeons. Okay, this is probably the pigeon that you're used to seeing or that you're familiar with, but these are also pigeons, different kinds of pigeons, and it's all been done through breeding. So natural selection, um, just as a background, far more individuals are born than survive to reproduce. So nature is picking which ones are going to live long, which ones are not going to live long. Offspring tend to resemble their parents, but are not identical to their parents or to one another. And differences among individuals affect their chance of survival and reproduction, which will increase the frequency of those favorable tra traits in the next generation and, and generations after that. So when we talk about adaptation, a lot of people like to think of it as a, a, a changing to your environment. You're not changing to your environment. You're not Once you're born, you're not saying, you know what, it'd be very helpful in this environment if I had wings. I'm going to grow wings doesn't work like that but it's really something a favorable trait that you can start to use and is going to help you to survive in that environment so if you have a specific adaptation that another organism in your population doesn't have and it makes you more fit for that environment well you're going to live longer be able to reproduce or reproduce more often or better and your trait for that is going to be passed on while the other person that doesn't have the trait, they're not going to do as well, and their traits are not going to be passed on as well. So um, individuals with uh, uh, deleterious mutations are less likely to survive, reproduce, and pass their alleles on to the next generation. Now, migration of individuals or movement of gametes, such as pollen, um, <clears throat> between populations results in gene flow, which can change allele frequencies. Now, we talk about this idea of genetic drift, which is this random changes in allele frequency from one generation to the next. And there's different types of genetic drift. And uh, we talk about population bottleneck, where an environmental event results in survival of only a few individuals. And now you're only left with certain genes. And now all the organisms are going to start to have those genes. So it's kind of like a bottleneck effect there, or a funneling effect where... Now you, you funneled out all of these other organisms, and now you only have a certain set of organisms with only certain traits. You weeded out some of the, the other traits because those organisms did not survive the environmental event or the great change in the environment. And the founder effect says that if you have this, uh, this bottleneck, now you're going to see that the, the change, changes uh, in the allele frequency when a few individuals start to colonize a new area. So now... Um, after uh, uh, a, a, a bottleneck, you're going to have um, this, this new population become very different because you weeded out some of the genes in the gene pool. You also have non-random mating where self-fertilization is common in plants when individuals prefer others to the same genotype or have the same genes or, or homozygous genotypes uh, will increase in frequency and the heterozygous genotypes are going to actually decrease. You also have sexual selection, which a lot of times we don't talk about when we're first starting to talk about evolution, but um, the, the idea that individuals of one sex have a preference of who they want to also meet with, mate with and it's not necessarily based on their ability to survive, that's also going to influence which traits are going to be passed on. So um, you look at something like um, this bird right here, African long-tailed widow birds, they have these long tails to them, and that doesn't help them to survive. That, that actually might hurt them because it, it makes them kind of stick out to, to predators, but the females actually select the males. They want males with long tails. They like males with long tails. For whatever reason, you know, the, the long tail says to them, hey, this is a good mate. I want, this is a healthy, strong, 
good looking mate. I want that that male. And over many generations, their tails have gotten longer and longer and longer. So um, to test this, we can do uh, you know we can use our scientific inquiry and we can do an experiment where we take female widow birds. Um, where um, they, they prefer to, we say that they prefer to mate with males that display long, long, lo the longest tail and longer tail males thus are favored by sexual selection because they, they will father more offspring. So we capture the males and we artificially lengthen our shortened tails by cutting or gluing on feathers, right? So now we have these different length feathered ones and it could, in a control group we cut and replace tails with their normal length to see hey is it really have to do with the the tail length and we release the males to establish their territories and mate and we count the number of nests with eggs or young on each male's territory and what we see is that um, <clears throat> the ones with the shortest tails did not do very well and the the um, the normal ones did just as are the the ones with the the fake lengthened tails, the same length as the normal ones did just as well as each other each other. And actually, ones that had long ones to begin with that we lengthened, they did the best. So our hypothesis that the the um, length was sexually selected for that the females wanted the longest one possible uh, was was accepted was true. So when we look at um, um, science we're looking at qualitative traits all right at versus quantitative traits qualitative is going to be influenced by alleles at one locus often uh discrete qualities so black versus white and then you have quantitative traits um shows uh continuous variation so body size of individuals it's not black versus white blue versus red um, it's going to be, oh, maybe, you know, you're, you're five foot four, maybe you're five foot five, maybe you're five foot six, maybe you're five foot seven. There's many factors that are going to influence that trait. So quality or qualitative traits versus quantity, quantitative traits. So in natural selection, you have different types of selection going on. You could have stabilizing, directional, or disruptive. So in stabilizing, you're going to see that the ones on the outskirts are going to start getting weeded out. And most are going to end up being the, the kind of in the middle, right? So if we look at a trait, um, <clears throat> excuse me, you might say, oh, yeah, um, uh, the ones that have really short tails don't do well, but the ones with really long tails don't do well either. So what we see over time is these start to get weeded out, and most of them start to have a medium-sized tail. And then we have directional um um, selection where maybe you say, hey, you know what? The ones with um, the longest tails, they do the best. So um, if I have long tails over here and short tails over here, well, now all of them are going to shift towards having this, this longer tail, okay? Or you can have disruptive selection where they start to go separate ways, all right? It's not good to be perfectly in the middle, all right? You either want a semi-long one or a semi-short one. So there's different types of mutations. You have uh, synonymous mutations, which are silent mutations, which does not change the encoded amino acid. You have non-synonymous, which are missense, changes it to um, uh, um, uh, uh, switch the the, uh, um, the the nucleotides around. Um, and in substitution rates uh, are if Substitution rates are highest at positions that do not change the amino acid because uh, uh, being expressed, which is our, our synonymous substitutions. And substitution rate is even higher in pseudogenes or copies of genes that are no longer functional. So in genes that are no longer functional, we often see these mutations. Um, so you have insertion mutations, deletion mutations, and rearrangement of DNA sequences. And they can have a larger effect than point mutations, and they can change the reading frame of protein coding sequences, which we'll talk more about in class. So sexual reproduction uh, results in new gene combinations and produces genetic variation that increases evolutionary potential. But you don't have to produce reproduce sexually in order to have changes in your uh, genetic combination. So in short term, you have sexual reproduction does have disadvantages where recombination can break up uh, adaptive combinations of genes. It can actually hurt you by removing some of the 
uh, pos the uh, uh, positive genes or the genes that have a positive effect on you, reduced rate at which females pass genes to offspring, and then uh, they dividing offspring into genders reduces the all, all overall reproductive rate because now it's a matter of that male ha that female has to find a male, that male has to find a female. What if there's not that many females around? What if there's not that many males around? It makes it more difficult than if you just reproduce asexually without sex, you are able to just um, um, reproduce without anything. It's, it's a lot easier that way. So how, you know, you might wonder, well, how did you create some changes in excuse me, in organisms that reproduced asexually, um, such as bacteria. Well, not only did they have mutations that happened, you know, every 3,000 generations there was a mutation, but also you had lateral gene transfer where uh, one bacteria was able to transfer genes to another uh, um, bacteria. So individual genes, organelles, genome fragments move horizontally from one lineage to another. One bacteria was able to inject its DNA into another. And that's how, when we look at viruses, that's what viruses do. They, they are going to go in and they are going to um, become part of the genome. And that's why we have a lot of viral DNA in our DNA, because we have, viruses were around a lot longer than we are, and they have incorporated themselves into our genome. So species may pick up DNA fragments directly from the environment, Genes may be transferred to a new host in a viral gene, DNA a, a genome, or hybridization might result, or the mixing might result in the transfer of many genes. So lateral gene transfer can be advantageous. It increases the variation, common in bacteria, relatively uncommon in eukaryotes, but that's why eukaryotes are going to reproduce sexually. Um, but hybridization in plants, which are eukaryotes, can lead to gene exchange. Um, when we talk about where do we see um, some of these ideas in agriculture, breeding programs have benefited from uh, evolutionary pr principles, including incorporation of beneficial genes from wild species. So we've taken genes from wild species, put them into um, <clears throat> some of the crops that we want to grow, and it has helped the crops grow better. That's where you hear about GMOs. GMOs have this bad connotation. Everyone says, oh, GMOs are, GMOs are bad, but they help to feed our exploding population, right? We have uh, over 7 billion people. Well, how do you feed that many people? You need to have crops that are going to be able to survive against some of the, the issues that, that they have that, that can kill off the crops. An understanding of how pest spe species evolve, resistance to pesticides has resulted in more effective pesticide application and rotation schemes over time as we learn more about how can we um, incorporate pesticides as well as our understanding of evolution in order to get get the, the best balance. So keep these things in mind as we move forward. And we also have molecular evolution um, is used to study disease organism, uh, organisms. Um, you know, we can look at how do viruses evolve? How do how does bacteria evolve? And, and how is that going to be influenced by um, 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 antibiotics and, and antibiotic re resistance? So all new viral diseases have been identified by evolutionary comparison of their genomes with those of known viruses. So we can look at, um, at something like COVID-19 and say, oh, you know, that, that came from MERS. That came from another virus and it mutated and became this other virus. So we have a, a, an understanding of really what family of viruses it belongs to. And studies of the origins, timing of emergence and, and global diversity of human pathogens, including things like HIV, um, um, tuberculosis, COVID-19, they depend on evolutionary principles and methods as do efforts to um, develop effective vaccines. So 